Thank you, Raju. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Om Sthapata Echa Dharma Sya Sarva Dharma Surupine Avatara Varishthaya Rama Krishna Yate Namaha Srudis Murdipura Nanam Alayam Karunalayam Namami Bhagavat Padam Shankaram Loka Shankaram so to give a brief summary of what we have been discussing so far. Um, at the very beginning, I um, explained in brief the 12 systems of Indian philosophy, six systems called Astiga Darsanas or theistic or orthodox, and six systems heterodox or unorthodox or nastika darsanas and among the astika darsanas or theistic systems there are six one is vedanta that is based on uttarami mamsa it's called uttarami mamsa badrayana is the great teacher then purami mamsa that is jaimini the teacher then nyaya and vaisheshika nyaya is indian logic that is uh, the school of Gautama and Kanada, the Vaisheshika, and then Sankhya and Yoga. Sankhya uh, school belongs to Kapila, based on Kapila Sutras and Ishira Krishna Sankhya Kariga, and then Yoga, which is based on Patanjali. Then mm -hmm. six non orthodox or heterodox or Nastika Darsanas. The ancient Indian materialism called Charvaka Darsanas or Loka Ethikas, and then Jaina philosophy, and then of course the four schools of later Buddhism, Sautrantika, Vaipashka, Vijnanavada, and Shunyavadas, two schools of idealism which belong to the Mahayana tradition, and two schools of realism which belong to the Hinayana tradition. So, of course, there are many other innumerable systems of Indian philosophy belonging to the Tantra tradition. And there are many other fringe groups also, which we may discuss in course of time. Among the theistic systems, which are called theistic or astika darsanas, because they look upon Vedas as a primary source, Shabda Pramana it is called, they accept Vedas. And also they believe in certain fundamental cardinal principles of Hindu religion, like for example, reincarnation, you may call it rebirth. Then uh, some doctrines related to karma theory, the doctrine of law of karma, transmigration of the soul. Some of these ideas are also included, are part of the theistic tradition. So, and the, and the atheistic, what you may call heterodox. In fact, it's not atheism. In Indian system, uh, we may not, we, we need not call the Nastika Darsanas as atheistic, the way we use in Abrahamic, in the context of Abrahamic religious philosophies, because they do not accept Vedas as a primary source. They don't accept the Vedas. So they're called Nastika Darsanas. I know we are we were we have been discussing, we are focusing mostly on Advaita Vedanta because among the Uttara Mimamsa traditions, among all these six schools of Astika Darsanas or theistic Darsanas, Vedanta philosophy is the only active and functional system of thought, in the sense, it is the only philosophical tradition which is a large following all over India and outside also which is being revived, reinterpreted, taught and championed by great teachers, beginning with Shankaracharya and modern times, um, great monks, great teachers like Swami Vivekananda. And following Swami Vivekananda, you find many other great teachers, both lay and also monastic teachers, like Swami Chinmayananda, who was champion of Vedanta, who came, actually he was following the footsteps of Swami Vivekananda and others, Dr. Radhakrishnan, another example, was a great Indian 
teacher, Indian philosopher, Yasan Das Gupta, Hiriyanna, TMP Mahadeva, and many others, they all were more or less champions of the Vedantic tradition. The Vedanta includes many other systems also, other than Advaita, Ramanija, Madhva, Vallabha, Nibbarka, Chaitanya system. They all, they all belong to Vedantic tradition. So it is Vedanta philosophy that is now um, uh, most popular. And among the different schools of Vedanta, it is Advaita Vedanta or non-dualism that is uh, becoming very popular. It will already be very popular all over the world. And when I, when I use the word the fundamental text, remember, I don't mean the books because the books are so voluminous. Mostly, I'm focusing on some of the fundamental statements in all these systems of philosophy, including the different schools of Buddhism, Jainism, and also material, materialism, Indian Charvaka system. So some of the fundamental texts, some of the fundamental statements from the primary texts of these systems, that's what we are discussing today. And we're discussing, we're focusing on Advaita Vedanta for the last two sessions. Dealing with Advaita Vedanta, as I mentioned earlier, some of the most fundamental teachings of Advaita Vedanta. For example, there is one absolute reality, Brahman. So Brahma Satyam, Brahman is only absolute, eternal, unchanging reality. Everything else is only changing or relating or non-absolute, not unreal, but non, not, they're, they're non-absolute, they're not absolute but they are not absolutely unreal. They are, of course, not absolutely real. It's called non-absolute, relative, changing. The world is such a reality. The biggest question and the most debated question in Advaita Vedanta is as the status of the world. What do you mean by saying this word Jagad Mithya? It has been subjected to many discussions many controversies, including the great objections raised by the great Indian system builders like Ramanuja, Madhva, Vallabha, Nimbarka, and many others, also many Nayayagas, Indian logicians, Mumamsagas. They all raised many questions, many objections on this fundamental doctrine. What do you mean by saying that this world is not absolutely real? It is only an apparent reality. It is mithya. So this word mithya has been defined by four great post-Shankarite philosophers who all actually followed Shankaracharya's tradition. They are Patnabada, who was a disciple of Shankaracharya. Then after him, uh, Prakashat Mayedi, and then after him, uh, Chitsukhacharya, and then Ananda Bodha. So their books are, those who are interested because these being recorded, this can be used for academic studies by those who are interested in the traditional study of Vedanta philosophy. Patmapada, who was a disciple of Shankaracharya, wrote a book, Panchapatika, which is actually an interpretation of Shankaracharya is Brahma Sutra Bhashya, and he defined Mithya as Sadasatta Anadhigaranattum va Mithyattum. Sat Asat Anadhigaranattu. O Sat Asat Anadhigaranattu Rubam or Anirvachitthum Mithyattum. Indescribability, non definability is Mithya. It is, in fact, it is not a locus of either reality or unreality. This is the definition. We discussed this earlier. You can listen to the previous sessions. This is the first definition by Patma Badaji, one of the most celebrated definitions. The second definition was by Prakashat Mayedi, who defined in his book, the name of the book is Panchapadiga Bivarana, an interpretation of Patma Bada's book. He defined I mean, 
the world of multiplicity is eternally negated in what is perceived in that sense. I mean, it is eternally negated in the same locus where it is cognized. So we already discussed the third definition also is by the same author. Those who are interested, you can ask questions during interaction. When you get the real knowledge, what disappears? When you bring light, what disappears should be darkness. When you get real knowledge, if something runs away, disappears, that should be ignorance. That is also from Panchapadhyaya Vivaran. Okay, so we finished, we discussed these three definitions elaborately. So those who have, you can listen to the previous sessions, that will be helpful. The fourth definition, as I briefly mentioned in my last class was by Chit Sukhacharya, who wrote the well-known book, Tattu Pratipika. In Tattu Pratipika, he defines mithyatum, illusoriness, or the, or, or the state of this world, being defined as relative or apparent means swasraya nishtha atyanta bhava pradyogitta mithyatu. I mean, the locus of which is equally the locus of its negation, eternal negation. So, swasraya nishtha means atyanta bhava pradyogitta. Wherever it is found to be located, there itself is once for all negated in that sense, or differently, an object which is invariable is absent where it seems to be present. So it is actually non existent there, it's not existing there, but it seems to be present. Of course, this uh, is being slightly modified by Madhusudana Saraswati. So you should remember Madhusudana Saraswati's name, the very famous name whenever you discuss Mithya. This man was a great intellectual. He lived around 16th century. He mostly lived in Benares, where he studied, where he went to study Advaita Vedanta, remained. And surprisingly, he was also a very great devotee. I shall say a few things that are very interesting about this man, Madhusudana Saraswati. So why are we referring to him? He wrote a well-known book. He wrote many books, including a great commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, Gurartha Deepika, which I had the occasion to teach. It's a very fairly big text, which I had the occasion to teach. But his most important book is Advaita Siddhi, which is one of the most difficult dialectical works in Indian philosophical tradition. In fact, during the post shankarai period, this is one of the remarkable works. So what he did? So she give the background. I already mentioned the four Oshankarite Advaitins who defined Mithya. Padmapada, who wrote Panchapadhyaya Vivarana, Pragasa Medhi, who, sorry, Padmapada who wrote Panchapadhyaya. Remember, Padmapada was a disciple of Shankaracharya. The name of the book is Panchapadhyaya. And on Panchapadhyaya, an interpretation, a commentary was written by Prakasa Medhi. The name of the book is Panchapadhyaya Vivara. Then another philosopher came, Chitsuka Acharya, who wrote a well-known book, Tattu Pratipika. And then later, Ananda Bodha, who wrote Nyaya Deepa. Four of these great thinkers together defined, gave, or rather give, gave five different definitions to Mithya, Tum. Okay, now these definitions were taken up by a great dialectician belonging to Dvaita Sampradaya, Dvaita tradition. He was actually a follower of Madhvacharya. His name was Vyasa Tirtha or Vyasa, Vyasa Raja. I discussed this earlier in my previous session. You can listen to that. So he refuted, he logically, he refuted these definitions of Mithyattva. From so many different ways, he refuted from the Nayaga point of view. And he was, a, he was an, an absolutely wonderful, very articulate dialectician and logician. So he refuted. 
So his book is known Nyaya Amrita, which created big, big, uh, uh, it was a big name and he created a big furore in Indian philosophical landscape. You can imagine this man writing this book, sitting somewhere in Karnataka. He was a guru. He was an abbot of a great asama, a great monastery. And he was, of course, he was a big man in the sense he was the Raja Guru, of, uh, the greatest king of South India at that time. His name was Krishnadevaraya, well known as a great military uh, tactician and military strategician. His guru was Yasadevta. So, and also he was a great scholar. He wrote this book and he, he criticized Advaita and uh, he demolished many of the views of Advaita Vedanta or he thought he demolished as we are going to find out. He only thought he, he was, could not demolish. After him came this Madhusudana Saraswati. He was living in Benares and he took up the task of defending this doctrine of Mithyatum or this doctrine of world being considered to be only apparent or relative or not absolute. And he took up all these objections raised by Vyasadirtha and then demolished his arguments and defended Advaita Vedanta. So that was the uniqueness of this great person, uh, Madhusudana Saraswati. Now, uh, coming to this subject, I mean, uh, the Madhusudana was also a great devotee, which we'll discuss in course of time. And Chitsuka Acharya's definition is the fourth one, that is, Swasay Nishtha Atyanda Bhava Pradyogitamva Mithyatu. The fifth definition is by Ananda Bodha. In this book, Nyaya Deepavali, he says, Sat Vivikta I mean, in other words, what he said is, it should be different. Sadvivittattu means mithyattum is different, something which is different, distinct, something else other than the reality. I mean, reality is the character of being certified by pramana. This and uh, if somebody argues that this world is absolutely real, it, can, it cannot stand any critical analysis. In that sense, it cannot be accepted. It is against Pramana. I can just give a sample. How Madhusudana takes up? This is only a very simple sample. I mean, we can see the just a bird view of a few statements from the unique work with the city. As I mentioned earlier, it's a very difficult book. So as I mentioned, he's defending uh, Ananda Bodha's definition of mithyatum, sad viviktatum mithyatum. Now Madhusudana says, what is false city? What is uh, mithyatum? It is being different. It is different from what is real. Now he, ex he explains Satum cha pramana siddhattum, pramanatum cha dosha asakrita jnana karanatum. Pramana siddhattum, so is defined by Madhusudra. So, and he says pramana siddhattum means apadhyattu vyapyam. So I will explain this. What he says is very simple. What is false? should be different from the real. Now, the point is, anyone would I will agree with this. It's a simple statement child can say. But when it becomes a big statement and a, or a, just a statement uh, which is linked to a great philosophical doctrine of a metaphysical system, and when it is taken up by great dialecticians and argued about, then this simple statement has got a lot of meaning. Because if you cannot prove that this world is 
uh, non absolute or this world is false in the ultimate sense then if we cannot prove that then advaita cannot stand you should remember what is the meaning of false and what is the meaning of real what is the meaning of unreal in vedanta it is totally different from what you use in literature so that's an important thing in philosophy many of these technical terms do have a lot of significance lot of meaning is he a novelist or short story writer may write a word the same word when used by kant or hegel or aquinas or augustine has got a different meaning so a word used is by short story writer on your daily conversation may have a very simple elementary meaning you look at the dictionary chambers webster's oxford dictionary you make it a meaning but that is not the meaning when it is used as a part of a of an elaborate metaphysical system so real with the capital letter r underline maybe you can put in thick bold letter if you are typing what is the meaning of real or reality something that remains the same in the past present and future something which is perceived in the same way when you are sleeping in deep sleep when you are dreaming or when you are waking when you are walking san francisco streets you perceive something you perceive the same thing when you are sleeping in deep sleep or also when you are dreaming so in three states of human consciousness and in three states of time past present and future it should remain the same also it should be it, it should not have any of the six changes you got sat vikara six changes jayade asti vartade viparinamade apakshide vinashi something that comes into existence is a change from non from empirical non existence to existence something comes into existence it exists it grows it evolves it decays it disappears or dies out these are six changes the absolute reality or capital letter it should not have any of these changes it should remain the same in the past present and future and it should be perceived the same manner in the three states of human consciousness it is beyond it is the eternal changeless reality is there anything in this world which satisfies these conditions no even this cosmos whether you you believe in genesis you believe in god's creation or you believe in darwin you believe in evolution whether you are an evolutionist or you are a creationist whether you are somebody like richard dawkins or you are somebody like a pious christian praying in a church you believe in creation whether you are an evolutionist whether you are a creationist you have to accept this world is changed this cosmos is changing this universe is changing billions of years the world universe this remain the same so it is not it doesn't satisfy the conditions of the real capital letter r the absolute reality so that absolute reality is only brahman and it never comes into existence it never born because it is always there it never dies because it is always there it never grows or evolves or decays because it doesn't undergo any change what is that it is one divine spirit an approximation of this idea you may get in the only christian theology and that we can think of that is mr eckhart for which of course you have to pay terrible price that's a different question so the point is now except this brahman or atman this divine reality that is present everywhere everything else in this world is only relatively real not absolutely real now you can imagine the simple word real which in the oxford dictionary chambers dictionary means something it has becomes a big like a mount everest in dialectical words and that is what these great dialecticians are are being so now you can imagine so what madhusudana acharya sorry madhusudana saraswati is he is an acharya of course he, he what madhusudana saraswati says is 
satyam cha pramana siddhatvam but it means is reality is the character of being certified by all tools of epistemology direct perception inference analogy uh, or maybe presumption negation use anything comparison you use or verbal testimony of course i have described four more tools which are specific to certain french systems of indian philosophy later if you use any of these pramanas we call praman pramana means proof the point is the reality the absolute reality is something which can be proved by all these pramanas or by any of these pramanas by any of these uh, epistemological tools now the absolute reality of this world cannot be proved by any of these pramanas by any of these proof you cannot prove that this world never undergoes any change because it undergoes change so it is only relative satyam cha pramana siddhatvam pramanatvam cha dosha asakrta jnana karmatvam what it means is what is pramana pramana is an instrumental is a karana is an instrumental cause of a cognition without any inherent defect means some kind of a proof which is inherently accurate and complete and not only that it cannot be cancelled what you actually can prove to be absolutely real can never be modified it cannot be cancelled is reality cannot be cancelled cannot be negated cannot be questioned it is abadhitva vyapyam is no i'm just giving just one simple example now after this we will come to another subject now another very interesting subject what is the concept of creation in advaita vedanta this has been discussed elaborately in so many texts so many important statements of shankara's commentary and also in the upanishads for example um sadabho adapyada sadapastapta idam sarvam srijeda etc you can try the upanishad there is a paragraph but before going to that i shall explain this in the words of shankaracharya the great commentator the great original exponent of advaita vedanta what is the status or how do these non dualist philosophers how do they look upon this world in other words what is creation what is this what is the status what is the ontological status of this world in advaita vedanta so there is a very famous paragraph which is frequently quoted is a very famous paragraph it is also it reads like a wonderful ex- exquisite poetry in shankaracharya's commentary in the mandukya karika bhashya which is commentary on mandukya karika so remember it is mandukya upanishad is a very brief upanishad only 12 mantras 12 statements 12 slokas 12 mantras it has been elaborately uh, explained and expanded and commented upon by another great teacher suresh sorry, sorry gaudapadacharya gaudapadacharya came almost 150 years before shankaracharya so he must have lived around 6th century or 5th century ad so his name is gaudapada and he wrote a commentary in metrical form it is called kariga so he wrote gaudapada kariga or mandukya kariga means a commentary in verse in sanskrit which la- much larger 225 much larger than mandukya upanishad which is very brief which is only 12 mantras now shankaracharya who came 150 or 200 years later after godabada he wrote a commentary on both this upanishad and also godabada's commentary so shankaracharya's commentary on godabada's commentary on mandukya upanishad it's a commentary upon commentary because without shankaracharya's commentary 
Gaudapada's Kairika, which is a commentary on Mantuvi Upanishad, uh, may not be very readable, may not even make much sense because this, it is Shankaracharya who brought out the metaphysical, uh, the philosophical dimension of this great work. So what do you mean by creation called Srishti? Called Srishti Chinda means Srishti Vijara. I mean, the concept of creation in Advaita. Now, the concept of creation in Advaita is called magic. Now, you may think it may be, it may surprise you. Suppose a magician comes and makes a show. And, and you know, now you, you, or you may go for a magic show. One hundred dollars you may pay, one hour play. Now, unless you are, unless you are, unless you are, you are uh, under, the, under the wrong notion, the illusion, or under the spell of the magician, you won't actually believe, maybe for one hour, on what the magician is demonstrating. So for that short time, what is actually false is believed to be real by you. That's why you pay hundred dollars. Even magician is playing something, and if you are not at all duped by him, then hundred dollars is not worth paying actually. Because for one hour, you are deluded into thinking that what this man shows is real. After afterwards, you know, you may dismiss the whole thing. Now, like that, this world itself is a magic. So a magician you cannot dismiss because afterwards you have to pay the money to him. So he's standing there for well dressed. He's real, but magic, magic is not real. Like that, the creator, the man, is real. The creation is only an appearance. Now, this, this is a long paragraph. I shall recite from memory or I shall quote and I shall explain because this is an important text which should be quoted. Vibhudit vistara ishwarasya sushtiridhi sushti chindakaha manyandhi. Vibhudit vistara means expansion of this glory or the power of God. It is only a, man, it's a manipulation or expansion of God's power. Remember, in this context, the, the idea, God idea is taken. And again, we must remember, Shankaracharya doesn't deny the reality of a personal God. What he says is, there is a higher, there is a higher view, there is a more complete picture. It's again a total, you know, it is absolutely false if somebody tells you that, Oh, Advaitins do not believe in God. Absolute gibberish it is. Most of the Advaitins were great believers in God. They were going to temples. In fact, I mentioned on many occasions, the most profound, the most moving devotion poetry in Sanskrit language were not written by Kalidas, apparently the best known poet of Sanskrit literature. It was written by Shankaracharya. More, no less than 65 of the most exquisite poems were written by Shankaracharya, who conceived God as transcending forms, as transcending creatorship. So, who conceived of Ishara as the creator of this world. So the point is, uh, that is a discussion here. So he says, uh, of course, I shall explain this further, just to drive home this idea. Advaita doesn't deny devotion. Advaita doesn't uh, rule out the reality of a personal God. Advaita goes beyond it. If you want any proof, Madhusudana's name I mentioned, the greatest Advaitin dialectician during the post shankarai times. Apparently, the author of Duracity, which is certainly the most complicated, complex dialectical work in, in Vedantic tradition, written during the post Shankarai time, because you cannot compare anything with Shankaracharya. So, after Shankaracharya's time. 
this madhusudana saraswati he mentioned once i am writing is advaita siddhi a great dialectical work well i am um, and he expounded this great work in the cutthroat language of pure logic and then he says at in my heart my joy is to conceive lord krishna as a small little child playing on his flute is something like saying imano khan after writing to take a pure reason suppose he goes every sunday for a confession to church to pray how it would look it would look like candidates will never teach this book because in the stern philosophical traditions unfortunately sometimes not always but sometimes an idealist should have nothing to do with anything the real world if a is right b should be wrong but vedanta will tell you a if a is right that doesn't mean that b should be wrong b should be another approach another another uh, another way of approaching the reality e a is right okay it doesn't mean b c d should be all wrong no b also can be another approach another way of looking at the reality now here madhusudana saraswati is well known verse is that which is actually he Uses sometimes some of his versions as a Mangala Charan, as an invocation in his commentary on Guru Arthi Bhaga, which is a famous uh, commentary on Bhagavad Gita. So he says, "Vamsi vibhushita kara navani dara bhag pidam parad aruna bimba phalad adharosh tha purneendu sundara mukhat aravinda netrad Krishnat param kimabi tattum aham na jani." So a cutthroat dialectician, and he says, in an emotion surcharged mood, this man says, "But for me, I do not know of anything other than the little child Krishna, holding his flute with his hands, whose color is similar to that of a fresh rain cloud, wearing a beautiful yellow cloth, whose lips resemble a red bimba." fruit whose face is beaut as beautiful as the full moon and whose eyes are like lot lotuses so the greatest dialectician in real life every day he was going to temple he was praying because it is possible because the transcendental doesn't deny the phenomena the transcendental transcends the phenomenon the impersonal concept doesn't reject or deny the personal concept it only goes beyond it so the greatest dialectician was also an emotion surcharged the devotee who was praying and going to his humble temple as humble devotee praying before the child krishna some of you may have seen this Hare Krishna, great devotee, Hare Krishna. You know, child Krishna is like flute. You know that. That is that was the most exquisite, the most uh, um, endearing image of God for the greatest cutthroat dialectician. That's an interesting thing. So it means you may be a dialectician. You may be. You may. Be, you may emphasize on the impersonal, the transcendental aspect of God. but that doesn't mean that you need you should not pray to god in your own personal life for your heart you pray to your god at the same time you understand that god that god idea is essentially an all pervading divine transcendental spirit that is the greatness of vedanta shankaracharya doesn't deny the reality of the world he only tells you that this world is not eternally real it is not unchanging it is only change which every is very is a common sense understanding but he develops this into a unique philosophical doctrine so anyway so and i shall just read that paragraph from godavada karika bhashya shankaracharya's commentary on godavada he says vibhuti vistara ishwarasya sastidhi 
ಸೃಷ್ಟಿ ಚಿಂತಕ ಮನ್ಯಂತೆ ನದು ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ಚಿಂತಕ ಸೃಷ್ಟೌ ಆಂಧರ ಇತ್ಯರ್ಥ ಇಂದ್ರೋ ಮಾಯಾಭಿ ಪುನರುಪಯ್ಯತೆ ಇದು ಸುತೇಹಿ ನಿ ಮಾಯಾವಿನ ಸೂತ್ರ ಆಕಾಶೆ ನಿಕ್ಷಿಪ್ಯ ತೇನ ಸಾಯುಧ ಆರುಚ್ಯ ಚಕ್ಷುಗೋಚರದೀತ್ಯ ಯುದ್ಧೇನ ಖಂಡಶ ಚಿನ್ನ ಪತಿದ ಪುನರುತ್ಥಿತ ಪಶ್ಯತ ತಕೃತ ಮಾಯಾಭಿ ಸದುತ್ತ ಸದುತ್ತ ಚಿಂತಾಯ ಮಾಧುರೋ ಭವತಿ ತೈವ ಅಯಂ ಮಾಯಾವಿ ಸೂತ್ರ ಪ್ರಸಾರ ಸಮಹ ಸುಷುಪ್ತ ಸ್ವಪ್ನಾಧಿ ವಿಕಾಸ ತದಾರೂಢ ಮಾಯಾಭಿ ಸಮಶ್ಚ ತತ್ಸಮ ಪ್ರಾಜ್ಞ ತೈಜಸಾಧಿ ಸೂತ್ರಾರೂಢಾಭ್ಯ ಅನ್ಯ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ಮಾಯಾಭಿ ಸ ಇವ ಭೂಮಿಷ್ಟೋ ಮಾಯಾ ಛನ್ನ ಅದೃಶ್ಯಮಾನ ಇವ ಸ್ಥಿತು ಯಾ ತದಾ ತುರೀಯಾಖ್ಯಂ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ತತ್ವ ಅತ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ಚಿನ್ ಸದಚಿಂತಾಯಾದ್ರ ಭೂತಿ ಮುಮುಕ್ಷು ನಾರ್ಯಾಣ ನ ನಿಷ್ಪ್ರಯೋಜನಾ ಸೃಷ್ಟೌ ಆದರ ಇದು ಅತ ಸೃಷ್ಟಿಚಿಂತಕೇ ವಿಕಲ್ಪ ಇತ್ಯಾಗ ಸ್ವಪ್ನ ಮಾಯಾ ಸ್ವರೂಪ ಇದು ಸ್ವಪ್ನ ಸ್ವರೂಪ ಮಾಯಾ ಸ್ವರೂಪ ಇದು ಐ ಶಾಲ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೈನ್ ಸಿಂಪಲ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಸೊ ಎ ಮೆಜಿಷಿಯನ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಟು ಎ ಕಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಎ ಕಿಂಗ್ ಆಸ್ಕ್ ಹಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಮೇಕ್ ಗಿವ್ ಎ ಶಾಪ್ ಸೊ ವಾಟ್ ಇ ಡಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಸೊ ಯು ನೋ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಇನ್ ಸೂತ್ರ ಆಕಾಶ ನಿಕ್ಷಿಪ್ಯ ತೇನ ಸಾಯ್ ತೇನ ಸಾಯುಧ ಆರುಹ್ಯ ಚಕ್ಷು ಗೋಚರದ Suddenly he makes a, makes a, an announcement, the, the magician. Remember, this is something, an interesting prelude, you know. Uh, in fact, some of the European travelers, not only European, even Ibn, Ibn Battuta uh, is an Italian traveler who came to India, and uh, Al-Biruni, an Arabian traveler, and also some Portuguese and English uh, uh, travelers, have reported having seen this indian rock trick it's called indian rock trick i don't know whether this is uh, whether this is possible or not but anyway that is an entirely different subject we need not bother about the accuracy of or the possibility of what we are reading now but it is a description of what is known as the indian rock trick so a, a magician comes to a court a king's court and he makes a proclamation saying that i am called to go to heaven because a group of demons are invading the angels so the angels are sending an sos for me to go and assist them he is a military help assistance so the magician says he is fully armed he makes the people believe that he is armed then he throws a rope into the sky then people see him climbing through this rope an indian rope trick you know he seen to be climbing this rope and then he disappears and after some time people hear a lot of fighting going on clash of steel clash of swords um, weapons and then a lot of dead bodies falling to the ground then you know and people believe terrible things are happening the magician is dead and people are being killed in heavens after some time everything gone then people look around they find the magician is standing the smile in modern time you may asking for his check so the point is now when the magic is going on the onlookers may think magic is real but here mayavi or magician is real but maya or magic is unreal magic is only an appearance because there was no magic before the magician arrived at king's court there will be no magic after some time because when the, when the illusion is gone there is nothing so the point is this world is like a magic god is real the creator that is why you know vibhuti vistaraha ishwarasya srishti so here ishwara the creator is real the creation is only an illusion the creation is only an appearance now what does it mean if we can think of this world this universe as a magic going on for the last several billions of years then it's only a dif- the dif- difference in degrees not difference in kind so this is a classical interpretation of this world 
So what is wrong if somebody says this world is unreal or this world is only relative? Remember, doesn't deny the reality of this world absolutely. Only the absolute reality is denied, the relative reality is accepted. If I mentioned this earlier, what is absolutely unreal cannot be denied. You cannot, you don't, you don't take the, you don't take, you, you don't bother to deny what is absolutely unreal. You cannot deny because denial is possible only if there is a possibility of somebody not understanding its true nature. They have to really know God, God is not real. What is obviously unreal, there is no need to make a statement that it is unreal. What is obviously real, you cannot really deny its reality. And you don't have to make a statement about its reality. So I mentioned this earlier, Shankaracharya's great statement. Prasaktasya ka prastavaha, prasaktasya ko nishetha. Aprasaktasya ka prastavaha, aprasaktasya ko nishetha. What is obvious, common sense experience. You do not deny it and you don't have to affirm it. You don't have to make a statement about it. What is absolutely unreal, that also you don't have to deny, but you can you cannot certain, you certainly you cannot affirm it. But this world of names and forms and changes and different colors, different manifestations, people may wrongly assume or think that this world is absolutely real. So Vedanta says, this world is not absolutely real. It is only relatively real. And that's why Vedanta is again and again repeat the statement, you know, uh, so long as you have not reached this highest state of spiritual enlightenment, it's called Jivan Mukta, the liberated one. So long as that is your status, you have to live in this world as if the world is real. Then you have to do spiritual practices. You have to do karma yoga. You should do your duties your, properly. And then in course of time, when you get spiritually enlightened, then the unreality of the world, or rather the relative, relativity of this world will become a matter of your own inner experience. It is not a philosophical construct. It is not a it is not an intellectual idea. It is something that that you that 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 occurs to you as a mad, as a fact of experience. Of course, uh, the this concept has been criticized many times. There are many texts. I can give I can give some example. For example, uh, you'll be surprised. Strong language was used by many Indian dialecticians and Indian philosophers uh, when, when they criticized this doctrine of mithya uh, One uh, One well-known statement, it comes from Vedanta Desika. Vedanta Desika Venkatanana. Vedanta Desika was a, the, the commentator of Ramanujacharya's important words. Ramanujacharya was the teacher, exponent of Vishistha called Qualified non dualism which believed that the highest concept of God is the totality of all good qualities. So if you can think of God as the totality of all that is auspicious, that's wonderful. But then what do you what do you make out of the reality of the unpleasant? Because there are many unpleasant things in this world. Then you have to invent the Satan or devil, who is all the time fighting with that God. The God is the totality of all the good auspicious qualities. Satan or devil is the totality of all that is inauspicious. So that will make the world a battleground. God and devil. God's is, uh, followers and devil's followers all the time fighting. So Advaita doesn't accept this. So Advaita will tell you Advaita doesn't accept the doctrine of the devil rather or the evil doctrine of error. 
I mean, the so-called evil is only a matter of ignorance, a matter of not proper understanding. But this was not properly understood even by many Indian thinkers. So I can quote one strong statement by Vedanta Deshika. Remember, this, they were all very saintly people. They were very pious people. But in the language, they didn't spare anyone. So you can find Prachanna Baudha Vishaye Parido Yadadhyum. So he wrote a well-known book, Shada Dushani. means 100 defects of non-dualism. 100 defects of non-dualism. Shada Dushani. Now remember, you know, in opposition to this, another Vedant Advaitin dialectician wrote Shada Bhushani. 100 auspicious qualities of Advaita. The point is, so this kind of intellectual warfare, they were physically, they were, they were not fighting. They were very pious. <laughs> the vegetarian, cutthroat vegetarian went to temples every day, did the puja, worship, the prayer, and be Buddhist and all that they did. But when they write, they, they write this strong language. He says, we should always fight with non-dualists because they are all Buddhists walking in cognito. <laughs> That's an interesting. Thing. They're walk, they're Buddhist walking in Kirkland. There is a philosophical connection in this. Many non-Buddhists misunderstood one important system of Buddhist idealism. It's called Vijnanavada Yogacara. It is a kind of a much more exotic kind of subject to idealism than Berkeley. So, uh, very often, so it, it, in, in other words, this um, the Yogacara of the uh, Vijnanavadas, in according to one school, there are many schools, in according to one school, that thing exists, subject and object. There is no objective reality, there is no subjective reality. It is some kind of a, uh, of a doctrine of not Sunyavada, but some kind of a all denying, world denying, philosophically very unsatisfactory doctrine. That is how they interpreted Buddhism. Not Buddhist, but non Buddhist, trying to find faults with the Yoga Jara system of, uh, of uh, later Buddhism. It's called in South Tarantika, in Vaibhasha, Vijnanavad, in Sunyavad. It's a four schools of Buddhism, which I referred to earlier. Two schools were realist by South Tarantika and Vaibhasha. And two schools were uh, idealist, Vijnanavad and Sunyavad. Nagarjuna was the exponent of Sunyavad and Vasubandhu, Chandragirti, many of those were Dignaga, they were the exponents of Yogacara system or each another name was Vijnanavada. So, this man, this Vedanta uh, Desika, he says, Prachanna Baudha Vishi Parido Yatattu means we should always uh, fight with these pseudo Buddhists. So, the, because of this Mithyatum, the idea of Mithya or the concept of Mithyatum, the world is only an apparent reality. The Advaitins were criticized by the uh, Vishuddha Advaitins or the followers of Ramanuja, like Vedanta Desika, as pseudo Buddhists. They are just like Vijnanavadins or Yogacara philosophers. Anyway, uh, we will discuss uh, some of the related subjects of Advaita in the next session. Now you are most welcome to ask questions. Namaskar. Thank you. Yeah. Most welcome with questions. Namaste Swamiji. I sent a video of the rope trip for uh, the benefit of everybody. The magician is uh, if you put it on the chat, I haven't seen it, but uh, maybe you emailed it to the other group. I, I put it on the WhatsApp channel. Gotcha. Swami? Yeah. What, what is the... Is Gotapada's... Uh, uh, is he considered 
uh, a very advanced expression of of uh, uh, of uh, Advaita. I know that Shankar wrote. I think it was the Ma Mandukya Karika. Mandukya is very good about the Karika. See, see. But is the is the Mandukya Karika that Gaudapada wrote? Yeah. Is that considered a very advanced expression of Advaita, or is that not so 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 highly regarded? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gaudapada uh, gave only the conclusions of Advaita. In other words, you know, among the among the pre-Shankarite Advaitins, I mean, among the Advaitins who lived before Shankaracharya's times, Gaudapada is the greatest thing. The other works which, which include Advaita philosophy, very elaborately, Yoga Vasistha, Adhyatma Ramayana, and uh, uh, there are just a few books which contain Advaitic ideas prominently. But Godabada's Kariga, like Mandukya Kariga or Godabada Kariga, it is considered to be one of the important books, maybe the most, the most important book belonging to pre Shankarite period of Advaita Vedanta. Uh, what he did, you know, Alata Shanti Padaranam is the last chapter. For your information, I gave a, I gave uh, some 60, 70 lectures on the Mandukya is available, audio is available in the website. So that was in 2012, 13, 14, that's around that time. So anyway, so Gaudapada, in a way, gave only conclusions. His doctrine of non-origination of the world. Ajadavada Rajadivada, non-origination. Uh, it is, in that sense, it is not a complete philosophy. It, is, it gives only the conclusion, the last statement, I mean, from the highest advancing point of view. It doesn't give any elaborate metaphysics or epistemology or anything. What Shankara did, he built a huge edifice. Then also he installed an elevator. So people can uh, reach the top of the building or the top of the hill, if you, want, if you like, because he built an elaborate system. Shankaracharya's uh, famous uh, devotional poems uh, addressed to different deities. Then his uh, introductory works on Vedanta, Vivega Chudamani, Tattva Bodha, Atma Bodha, and so on. Then his Pagarana Gandhas, which are higher introductory works. Then his commentaries. So it, it all looks like a huge edifice. In other words, he built a big university, but he also he uh, built kindergartens, primary schools, small colleges, and eventually you can reach university. Gaudapada made only a, the statement that, that comes from a university. So non-origination is the last word in Advaita evolution. But Shankaracharya takes you there. Gaudapada begins there and ends there. In, in Gaudapada's uh, work, he refers to 34 different schools of Indian philosophical systems which were prevailing during his time, roughly around uh, 5th or 6th century. Different deity, different followers, different, what, what in Sanskrit called sampradayas, different, different uh, denominations following different philosophical systems. So Godapada is the most prominent name uh, belonging to pre shankarite period of Advaita Vedanta. That's it. It's the only commentary on Mandukya Upanishad. Mm -hmm. It has 225 verses. Mandukya Upanishad has only 12 mantras. So he expanded it. Okay. Thank you and so Shankaraj much. wrote a commentary on all these. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yogi, Yogi, you, you're next. Yeah, most of it. Yogi, we can't hear you. Please go ahead. All right, while we're waiting for you. Yogi, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, oh, okay. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Pranam Maharaj. Uh, yeah. 
uh, the, uh, about the non origination of the yeah uh, the world and bhagavad gita we hear this uh, prakritim purusham chaiva vidyana uh, how do we vavapi yeah. vavapi how do we uh, how do advaitins uh, comment on that uh, when the verse clearly says there uh, both prakriti and purusha are beginningless yeah you know um, that in gita there are many references to sankhya philosophy as sankhya's belief in divinism to eternal uh, realities prakriti and purusha purusha is effulgent uh, but inactive prakriti is non not effulgent but active the source of our, the entire evolution so uh, this is a reference to uh the sankhya system slowly evolving towards vedanta it has nothing to do with the, the doctrine of non origination gaudapada gaudapada as i mentioned uh, what 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 he gave was the conclusion of advaita when you reach when you reach the highest spiritual experience of being identified with brahman the only reality then the the whole creation is perceived to be like waves uh, uh, emerging in an ocean uh, really speaking you know in an ocean uh, there may be waves and forms and drops of water uh, but you cannot say they exist independent of the ocean they are part of the ocean but then at the same time for the time being you may say that you know this a wave may be at a 30 feet wave it is different from the calm quiet water but really uh, are the waves different no because the same water for some time in some ways appears to be 30 feet tall and you may wrongly assume it is different from the water that that from which it is is come but really it is water only so, so there are no waves we can say in in what sense because there is only water no waves you can say but you can also say there are waves because 30 feet uh, manifestation of water emerging you can see but from a from a higher point of view you can say there are not real waves only water for some time appears differently that's all again this is the ultimate experience and that's what uh, godabada says non origination the world has not come into existence it is only a matter of the highest spiritual mystical experience it is not a philosophy only gaudapada uh, he uh, he focuses only on this aspect called ajadavada ajadavada is a matter of advaitic experience at the highest level but gaudapada was the first great teacher who articulated this doctrine uh, that's why he is a book has become very famous igula jadavada what you mentioned the gita it is only an analytical attempt to explain that is not the highest philosophy uh, indicated in that particular verse uh, when shankara wrote the commentary on bhagavad gita how did he defend this verse uh, advaita yeah it's, it's, again you know at the relative level you may appear these things may appear to be real but if purusha in its reality is a, all in tam all in compassing reality purishete iti purusha purnatva purusha kari shankara chai means purusha is nothing but the uh, supreme reality that is encased that is lying within this body mind complex that is purishete iti purusha purnatva it is purna means it is eternal it is uh, it transcends uh the three levels of consciousness waking dream and deep sleep and also it transcends the triple dimensions of time past present and future it is purna it is perfect complete eternal unchanging in that sense purusha is but prakriti the word prakriti used only uh in the context of sankhya system so remember sankhya philosophy can be found in many verses of gita but not in his not as its conclusion in his 
analytical aspect. You can find Mimamsa in Gita, uh, but secret Lord Krishna, this is Mimamsa, ritualism, Yakshidasya, I mean, Odishi, Kekyana Vimohitata. So also, you can find the Gita criticism of dualism. So dualism mentioned in Gita is the dualism of Sankhya, not of Manthacharya, because there was no Madhva. Manthacharya came only in 12th century AD, and Shankara lived in the 8th century. So in the Advaitic text of Shankaracharya, or before in the Gita and others, dualism implies Sankhya system. Sankhya is the, the, the main dualistic school of philosophy before Madhvacharya emerged. And Prakriti, Purusha, these are two eternal realities uh, in the Sankhya philosophy. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, before you. before AJ's hand, which I see up, there's a there was a prior chat question on the Zoom chat, not yeah. on the YouTube, but on the Zoom chat. There's a question requesting that you identify, say something about the relationship of Advaita and the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> yeah, no, I was giving an example. You know, Madhusudana Saraswati was not not part of this movement or anything. We're the opposite, but the point is. This great uh, Advaitin was such a great devotee uh, because devotion is not against Advaita. Uh, Advaita philosophy accommodates devotion ideas. This is a very important thing. In fact, there are many great statements in Shankaracharya's commentary which are highly Adv Advaitic and also devotional. See, Isura Anugriha Deva Pusa Advaita Vasana. Mahabhaya Paritrana Dutrana Meva Jayadi. Now, this is what it says is, you know, by the grace of God only, you get a taste for Advaita. You get a taste for non dualistic thinking only by the grace of God. That is what. Now, this is found in some editions of Kandana Kanda Khadya. Which is actually, I mean, uh, it is in a, an extreme kind of polemical, dialectical work written by Sri Harsha. An extreme kind of, much more extreme than even Madhusudana, polemical work. So, and it is cut He criticizes. The Nayayaga's interpretation of Nayaya criticism of Advaita. But he says one gets a taste, an interest in Advaita only by the grace of God. And the Shankaracharya says, you know, in Shankaracharya's tradition, in the in one of the prasthanas, you know, this Appaya Dikshida, Athapi Adugriha Deva, Tarune to Sikhamane, Advaita Vasana Pumsa, Avi Bhavadita Yatha means. So according to Apayadikshida, you see, only by the grace of God, one can get a taste and interest in Advaita. So where do you, where do you stand? That's why you have to, Advaita is an all accommodating, all uh, embracing uh, spiritual philosophy. Uh, remember, in real experience, all these great Advaita writers, they get up in the morning, they follow their rituals, go to the temple, they do their puja rituals, and the thing, uh, the sitting in front of the deity, and then they write a book which says the God is beyond deities, God is beyond temples. <laughs> this, uh, Mother Sudhana lived in Benares, Kashi, close to Vishnu the famous temple, Mother Sudhana. And they wrote they all this, but he, there are many stories about him about this daily visit to Vishnath Mandir, the temple. And he was writing a book which tells you that God is beyond temples. Not doesn't, doesn't deny the re, deny the association of the divine with temples and churches, but it transcends temples and churches and books. It doesn't contradict, not de reject or deny, but going beyond. See, you can see in Christian mystical tradition also. The great Christian mystics. After all, the church uh, came into blows with them only because they believe they can directly communicate the reality of Jesus of God 
without the uh, uh, unavoidable in the, uh, association of the hierarchy. That's all. A mystic is one who feels the presence of the divine all the time, everywhere, in all his activities, in all life situations. And he doesn't, he doesn't deny or reject uh, the, I mean, the confession or the prayer, what goes on in liturgy in the church. But he says, spirituality can even go beyond that. That's all. Doesn't re reject, but can go beyond that. Can transcend, need not reject. That's I got. Do the accept everything. Doesn't reject anything. Thank, Thank you, you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks for your patience, AJ. It's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Swami, for the lecture and for the opportunity to ask a question here. Um, so I first learned of uh, Viveka Chudamani through through these recent uh, lectures, Swami, and I have a question from, from there. Is this the right forum and time to ask or should I ask that separately? No, you can ask. You can ask, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So I was uh, looking at the English translation and I got stuck at the second one, which uh, a translation that I came across and it reads as, uh, for all beings, a human birth is difficult to obtain. Yeah. More so as a male body, rather than it is Brahmin, yeah. so yeah. on. So, is this yeah. an anachronism, mistranslation? Yeah. I, should, I should tend to thank you for this question. This question is mil emerged modern times, you know. So, the Dullabham Trayamayagayadat Daivanugrahayadva Manishuttam Mumukshuttam Mahapurusha Samsay. So, okay, now, you know, these three gifts from God uh, one is being born as a human being. Uh, and in being born as a spiritual aspirant uh, and also association with the great spiritual teachers. Now remember... Uh, Swami, uh, sorry to interrupt there. The, there was a point about being born as male and also a Brahmin. So that, that is the thing I'm uh, kind of confused about. Now remember, you know, in, our, in some of the traditional books, you find these words that may be partly because of the social conditions prevailing at that time. Uh, Shankaracharya is not, not making a statement that this should be only for uh, the male or should be only Brahmins, not at all. Maybe in those times, uh, in those social conditions, it was used. So remember, Swami Vivekananda uh, defined uh, education as the manifestation of perfection already in man. And religion is the manifestation of divinity already in man. So in 19th century English, man included entire humanity. That you have to remember. Nara, the word Nara is used, Nru means Nara is used in Sanskrit, which is masculine gender. But it means the entire species, humanity. That's the meaning here. This should be clearly understood. We are talking about 19th century English language. If you read, uh, if you read the writings of the lectures of Disraeli or Gladstone, Gladstone, the great British politicians, the prime ministers, they were using the word man. Swami Vivekananda is man-making religion. Education is man. Is, we, we need a man-making education. Man-make means give confidence. It doesn't man to the exclusion of the feminine. It means humanity. That is how language is used in those days. That applies to many of these traditions. And also you should remember the one of the greatest, the two of the greatest philosophers were equally great of Brihadarani Upanishad, maybe the entire Vedic world. One was a lady, and who was she? Gargi. The other was Yajnivalkya. Two great philosophers of Vijayaveda tradition, Sukhaya tradition. You can see any number of ladies in ancient times. And remember, can you imagine a lady coming in front of Plato, arguing with Plato? Can you imagine 
can you imagine a lady coming to Aquinas or Augustine, Augustine 5th century, Augustine much later? Can you imagine? But we are talking about 3rd millennium BC. And in Shukla Yajurveda, Bhagavad Gita, Gargi, who was, who was much more learned than Janaka, the big emperor. And in his, in his court, thousands of scholars have come, all these Brahmins, male, Brahmin, etc. She was called to speak. And then you know what happens? She charges ahead and challenges the greatest philosopher of those times, Yajnavalkya, who was Janaka's guru and a friendly, but very, very, very prolonged uh, argument. So we should always remember. So when you when you look at the work, you have to uh, you look at the work from the perspective of those times. This is one of the tools in hermeneutics. When you interpret scriptures and books, you have to uh, keep in mind the social conditions, the language that was prevalent during those days. You have to, you have to take all of this into consideration. It's an important to remember. This is a simple, uh, a simple uh, idea, simple common sense by interpreting any any ancient works. So, thank you, Swami. So, so that, that clarifies the the, yeah, the general thank you. part. Yeah, thank uh, you. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that clarifies the general part, but, but for the Brahminhood part, is that also uh, the same interpretation? Uh, based on the, the time? Uh, the word when... uses Dvija, yeah, yeah. Actually, that could be maybe uh, in those days, they were the only people who cared for this because of social condition, but it cannot be, that, that cannot be true because in this, in the Chandogya and Bhagavadana Upanishad, many of the great teachers are Kshatriya kings who are teaching Brahmins. You can imagine, Ashwabadi, and, and Ajada Shatru, these are all great names in Chandogya tradition. Right? Janaka in Bhagavadnik Upanishad, in the Shukla Yajurveda tradition. So, uh, it cannot be true. And not only that, in ancient India, uh, in the, during Vedic times, women were also initiated into, into Gayatri Mantra and Vedic studies. There are many, many sources like that. You know, these many of these social divisiveness may be later developments. If you look at an ancient book uh, with the prism of our own uh, social conditions, it may not be only doing justice to the great teachers or the great teachings. It's an important thing to remember. Thank you, thank you so much. Very thank helpful. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that um, yeah. that uh, yeah. Jana has unmuted. Um, is that to ask a question? Yeah, most of it. Namaskar, Swamiji. Yeah, yeah namaskar. I, I just also wanted to add about the clarification for a Brahmin that the question arose, that uh, only in the later period, uh, the classification became more caste based but till then it was it wasn't caste based right a brahmin was somebody who who was learned he could be of any caste well thank you for the question and most welcome but so i i have two important points to mention i shall certainly answer this question i'm very happy to answer this question but i would prefer that we can be confined we limit our conversation uh, as far as possible only to philosophical ideas or the text we discuss, because we need not take up subjects which can land us in some kind of a sociological or cultural or historical, sometimes maybe slightly controversial subjects. So as far as possible, you can limit, you can confine your discussion, your questions to ideas that we discuss, because mostly we are dealing with some ancient text, which is a it, uh, there are many of our friends who are watching this are looking forward to us discussions of philosophy, all these things. There are many, many platforms where uh, the subject that you refer to are discussed and they're very important subjects. 
I thank you for this question. But still, there are many, many platforms where these subjects are being discussed. So let us confine our discussion to philosophy, text, and but anyway, come to the subject. So thank you. No, okay. No, I shall come to the subject. In the Gita, Chadurvarnim Maya Sutam Guna Karma Vibhagashaka, Tasya Kartara Mabimam Vitti Akartara Mabiyam. So Lord Krishna says the four uh, divisions, social divisions in the caste were all they're a matter of our own cultural evolution, our own spiritual evolution uh, based on our characteristics, our temperament, and what we do, our the type of actions that we perform. People who uh, who are refined, who are spiritually more cultivated, and people who do good and great things, they may be exalted to the position of maybe different higher positions based on their qualities, temperaments, characteristics, and actions. This is very important to remember. So those who are more of a sattvic type, we will be damned. Sattvic yajoguna. Yajoguna dominating over sattvaguna, we will kshatriyas. And sometimes uh, uh, those who have got rejoguna and tamoguna will be vaisyas, those who are the predominance of tamoguna ashudra. This is now. So guna means our temperaments, characteristics, behavior patterns, our own refinement, spiritual refinement. So it was mostly a division based on where we stand in terms of our own uh, spiritual or cultural evolution or refinement. This is an important number. Historically speaking, uh, you find uh, casteism became a birth-based, a rigid institution, a, an inflexible social convention only around uh, 12th century, 13th century, AD. That's that's a view of many sociologists. Again, I want I don't want this discussion to prolong because there are many many views and there is a there is a little chance and possibility about sliding into some uh, unwell, undesirable channels of discussion and thought currents. The subject you mentioned, but uh, thank you for your interest in this. Uh, subjects in the, in the fundamental foundational text of Indian philosophy. Let us confine our discussion as far as possible to philosophical uh, ideas that, 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 that's within our scope of discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Ma Maharaj, um, yeah. you, made, you made reference to the robust um, intellectual debate, uh, the descent to Advaita uh, from uh, other other um, uh, promulgators of other schools and and the uh, you know the wild situation as they would take each other on uh, happily so and I wanted to I wanted to ask yeah. whether or not some of the um, characterizations of uh, Advaitins as um, masquerading Buddhists as uh, as pseudo Buddhists um, so. Was some of that possibly due to a lack of familiarity with the texts? In some cases, perhaps um, they would get access to more information and re revise their their objections. Are there examples that come to your mind where they would take a closer look and then say, no, no, sorry, uh, we were confused about this? Or did the battle just rage on? Yeah. You know, of course, uh, during the period between 9th century and 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, many uh, rigidly dialectical and polemical works were written defending Advaita. And some of them, like the Sikha Saguru, Khandana Khandaka, and others, they, they went too far towards uh, conceptualizing Advaita into some kind of a world negating, life negating idealism. That must have provoked a challenge from the opposite side. No, we want devotion. We want to worship our God. We want our temples. We don't care for your uh, extreme kind of uh, idealistic interpretation of 
God. No, we want our temples. So as a result of this, you know, uh, Ramanuja came, Vedanta Desiya came, Madhvacharya came in Madhva, Madhva tradition, Vadhidirtha, Jayatirtha, and Vyasadirtha and others came. So you find very often when somebody pushes Advaita too far, often going far away from Shankaracharya's own main pristine tradition, to Shankaracharya himself was a great devotee who wrote the, so many devotional poems and he, he was he's the author of the greatest and most moving devotional poetry in Sanskrit language. He installed temples. He also started, he also elaborated how we should perform worship. But then behind every worship, there is one transcendental, all-pervading divine reality. So this idea was always there. Now, this was forgotten and instead Advaita was sometimes were interpreted too far uh, into some kind of a, a world negating, life negating idealism. So that must have prompted a criticism from the opposite side, like Vedanta So he is not criticizing Shankaracharya here. So he actually says these people are Prachanna Bauddha, means pseudo Buddhist. Actually, Buddhists also were not this kind of God this kind of life negating philosophers. But among Buddhists also, especially there's Pravati Vijnanavada, you know, Vijnanavada Yogacara had two levels of evolution. One is Ale uh, Vijnanavada and Pravati Vijnanavada. At some point, some of the Buddhist writers in India, not outside India, remember, Buddhism uh, developed along two channels, two different ways in India and outside India. In India, many of the highly educated, traditional scholarly people, they went to Buddhist, they became Buddhist monks. They began to write very deep metaphysical, dialectical works on Buddhism, which, were, which never really happened outside India, really speaking. Buddha actually taught in the simple language the common people, Prakrit, and his teachings were mostly codified into Pali script, Tripedaga, Buddha, Vinay Pedaga, Abhidhamma Pedaga, Sutta Pedaga. So that was, um, and he passed away uh, 480 years. And a few years later, 50 years later, there was a first Buddhist council. It was held in, uh, in, 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 um, in Bihar. And they, they codified, they wrote down all this into Tripedaga. So the point is, Later on, from 2nd century BC onwards, up to about 6th, 7th century AD, a number of highly dialectical works were written on Buddhism, which also pushed Buddhism into an extreme corner. So that again created a lot of, uh, lot of opposition from the other side. So anyway, the, great, the, the beauty and the charm of it, as I mentioned earlier, those who wrote this extreme kind of dialectical works on Advaita were also very humble devotees, praying to their deity, doing their puja every day. So this is an important thing. So whether Sikhasha wrote Khandana Khandakadya or Apayadikshita or Madhusudana, any of them. So the point is, Advaita actually accommodates all other thoughts. It doesn't deny or reject anything. So Siddhanta Vyavasthasu Doyutino Nishida Dridam Parasparam Virudhyandi Taihi Ayamna Virudhyandi comes in Mandukya Kariya Gauravata Kariya. So he says, Dvaidins fight among themselves. It's not Dvaidins of Madhya tradition. Dvaidin here means Sankhyas. Or those who believe in, in divisiveness, those who believe things are, those who don't accept uh, unity behind diversity those who believe in kind of eternal diversity. So they fight among themselves. Advaita has no quarrel with anyone. Atma ananyatva, because the same Atman is present in everyone, everywhere, in that sense. Okay, so thank you for these questions. Uh, most welcome, all of you. I shall conclude now. Om Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Pranamastu. We have some very important announcements. Please listen. 
there will be no lectures or classes this summer recess except for the sunday evening class so please remember this class will continue our sunday 6 o'clock classes online classes on the foundational text of indian philosophy this will continue online throughout the summer recess but our old temple bhagavad gita uh, classes at 7:30 we hold we conduct the gita classes every friday 7:30 that will be cancelled during the summer recess beginning tomorrow and also our sunday lectures in the new temple but this class will always remain we will the please remember all of you can remember this particular class that we are holding at 6 o'clock every sunday on the foundational text of indian philosophy this will continue online throughout the, okay now we have a guru purnima celebration those who are from nearby places please remember we have a guru purnima celebration saturday july 16th saturday july 16th 10 am and also uh, we are celebrating the 125th anniversary of gramakshna mission so there will be a special lecture on saturday uh, july 16th this will be around uh, 12 o'clock uh, by swami chetananand ji swami chetananand ji of st louis center will give a lecture on the ramakshi mission 125th anniversary as part of a celebration of the 225th anniversary of the foundation of ramakshi mission and we will begin with puja at 10 am and then there will be this lecture please remember 16th uh, july 10 am guru purnima celebration in the new temple 2323 velayur street san francisco another announcement please keep in mind that is we have our annual labor day retreat saturday uh, sunday and monday september the 3rd 4th and 5th uh, we will have one hour lecture from 10 to 11 and then half an hour interaction uh, the subject is the role of spiritual values in modern education so this will be uh, held uh, in this hall in the in the uh, old temple uh, um, i mean in san francisco in a filbert and webster street junction <laughs> but remember you can get the latest information and updates from our website svedanta.org will give you the latest information please refer to svedanta.org so please remember uh, this lecture at 6 pm every sunday on indian philosophy will continue throughout you are most welcome okay thank you namaskar namaskar namaskar